Greetings and thank you for joining us today. I'm Michael O'Hanlon. I hold the Phil Knight Chair in Defense and Strategy at the Strobe Talbot Center at Brookings. And I'm just delighted today to be able to speak about the progress of military innovation and great power deterrence in the United States today as regards in particular uh, China and Russia abroad with two of the nation's most distinguished and accomplished and brilliant defense scholars, David Okmanik and Chris Bros. I'd like to take a minute to introduce each of them and their work because that's gonna set the foundation for where we go with the conversation today. They've both done very important writing over the years, advocating for major changes in how the United States acquires and fields military capability. And while these were always brilliant books on their own terms, and at the time you read them, these were not books that were to be read and forgotten. I, I hope most of our books at Brookings are not really like that, but uh, and neither one of them wrote for Brookings, to be clear. But these were books that were advocating a change of course and saying this was a matter of some national urgency. So even though I've been privileged to work with both before and host both before, it's been a while since we've taken stock of how the country is doing. And it's now two years into the Biden administration, five years or so since Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis put out the 2018 National Defense Strategy that essentially formalized the argument the United States should be shifting towards a greater emphasis on deterrence of great power competition and conflict. And therefore, it's an important moment to size up how well we've done. Also, just a few days ago, we hosted Under Secretary of Defense Colin Call at Brookings, where he acknowledged and was unapologetic about the fact that the new national defense strategy of 2022 for the Biden administration is in many ways building upon the foundation of the 2018 NDS, and in some ways, just the next iteration of the same logic. So it does seem fair to ask, roughly five years into this transformation, how are we doing? Uh, before I say a, a bit of background on both Dave and Chris, let me also apologize that we're only virtual today. That's essentially my fault because I started testing positive for COVID last week. And, and we've lost uh, Caitlin Tal Kalmage, uh, my colleague and Georgetown professor today, because she's under the weather as well, even uh, for a Zoom appearance. So we're going to have a three-way conversation. Myself, David, and Chris will invite your questions, and some of you have already submitted We've also got an email address, events at brookings.edu, events at brookings.edu. And for the last 20 minutes or so of our session today, we'll include uh, what's on your mind specifically. And we'll probably finish up at three o'clock just because 60 minutes seems to be the optimal Zoom session uh, we found over the years. David Okmanik, in many ways, is, I think, my big brother and mentor on defense analysis. I've been reading him and learning from him for close to 30 years. His book, The New Calculus, done with a, a group of scholars at the RAND Corporation in the mid-1990s, began to redefine defense modeling and analysis for the era of precision weaponry and precision strike. It took the lessons of Operation Desert Storm, but a lot of other things that incorporated them and made some uh, big arguments backed up by a lot of serious analysis of how the United States should rethink the challenge of deterring or fighting regional conflict, the likes of the Saddam Husseins, the North Koreas, the Irans. And like with all of Dave's, Dave's work, the ideas are big, but the analysis is rigorous and detailed and technologically very extremely well informed. Uh, he's done stints in and out of government over the years, various kinds of planning jobs in the Department of Defense, and uh, generally returning to RAND, uh, where he continues to write transformative uh, literature on the question of how do we improve U.S. military capability for the future. Specifically, in the last few years, he has advocated a kind of forward defense posture in the Western Pacific that would not depend as much on fixed, long, vulnerable runways and big, shiny $10 billion aircraft carriers sa uh, sailing near China's coast for bringing combat capability to any potential scenario for example, should China attack Taiwan. He has been looking for ways that we could ensure Taiwan's safety and security with military platforms that are more survivable against the realities of China's anti-access area denial, precision strike capability. And I think the amphibious assault scenario where China tries to seize Taiwan has been central to his work. Uh, but he's advocated for very specific kinds of platforms and that set a nice standard and metric against which we can evaluate some of the Pentagon's progress in recent years. We'll get to that in just a moment. Chris Bros wrote perhaps the most capturing and captivating book of defense analysis of the last decade in the United States, The Kill Chain, an extremely elegant, catchy concept. 
uh, that really brings it all together, how the United States and other countries in this era of precision strike and modern electronics uh, need to be able to find, acquire, identify, attack targets, and then do this not just locally with one single airplane or ship, but through a complex web of command and control systems that themselves together, all working together collaboratively, constitute what he calls a kill chain. And his argument has also been one of some urgency, saying that we're just not ready for this now, either because of reliance on big vulnerable pl platforms or reliance on command and control systems that are not robust against cyber attack or depend too much on single big shiny satellites in space that the enemy can track and attack if it wishes. Uh, and we have to find better ways. And he also has put forth a set of proposed solutions or I should say, in many ways, changes in how we do business that would start to address these problems. All this happens in the context of a situation, and I'll finish here, where the Pentagon and directors of national intelligence, uh, Secretary of State Blinken, have been arguing that we could be looking at an accelerated Chinese plan for pressuring or even attacking Taiwan in the years to come, maybe even in the course of this decade. I'm not sure I'm fully subscribed into the argument that Xi Jinping has a date in mind. I'm not sure I'm subscribed to the argument that he really uh, wants to or plans to use force, but we have to worry about this possibility now if we're going to deter it with the greatest effectiveness and further reduce those chances of what could easily become World War III uh, were it to begin. So gentlemen, thank you for listening to my long introductions, but you both deserve the accolades and I wanted to set the, the, the agenda straight. And, and Dave, maybe I will start with you in the sense that again, you're sort of the Dean of the three of us for how long you've been doing this, although you haven't lost a, a step in terms of your youthful vigor or your fresh ideas. <laughs> but, but how do you see us doing, my friend, compared with whichever benchmark you find most useful for measuring progress and going back in time to those previous national defense strategies yeah. to your earlier work, et cetera? <clears throat> Thank you, Mike. Uh, and let me say that when I was in Santa Monica in 1990, 90 or 91 or so, and we were getting ready to do what became the new calculus, someone sent me a draft of your doctoral dissertation at Princeton, where you were, was it, or was it your senior thesis? Dissertation. Either way, you were, you were examining what U.S. force structure should be in a world without the Soviet Union, post-Cold War. And I said to my colleagues, why aren't we doing something like this? So <clears throat> you go back, uh, quite a ways too, and I've greatly appreciated your work over the years. So I think you, you said a benchmark. <clears throat> Let me uh, offer for people's consideration that there are really three benchmarks or three dimensions that we need to look at when we think about the progress DOD is or is not making toward fielding the kind of force <clears throat> and capabilities that are appropriate for this very challenging world that we're in. Yes, we need to buy more and better stuff. And uh, there's, there's, a, there's a tendency to focus on the palms, the, the budgets, uh, to look for evidence that we're buying that stuff. But that in and of itself is not gonna be sufficient to move the needle. Um, we have to have a different way to fight. The, the, the legacy approach to power projection that worked so well against the junior varsity adversaries of the world, the Iraqs, the Serbias, the Libyas, consistently fails in our war gaming when it's tested against a China or indeed uh, a Russia, at least a pre-2022 Russia. And, I, and I'll talk about the reasons for that in a moment. So, so, so in addition to changing what we buy, accelerating the purchase of certain things, buying less of, of old things, more of new things, think about the concept that is being developed to employ those things in peacetime and war. And then thirdly, the other dimension is posture. By posture, I mean where forces are deployed in peacetime and where they intend to fight from in wartime. Uh, people uh, who, are, who were following the news back in 1990 will remember that it took five months to build that Iron Mountain on the Arabian Peninsula before the coalition was ready to kick Iraqi forces out of Kuwait. We may have five days to get our war fighting posture together in a future fight with China. So, so 
the expeditionary approach to power projection, which was at the heart of our post-Cold War concepts for deterring aggression, is not appropriate for, for deterring or defeating aggression by, by highly capable adversaries who can create this highly contested environment uh, that will make it very difficult for us to deploy forces into the theater and employ th forces there once they arrive. So, 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 so of those three, posture is the most visible. Um, and let me say that um, I'm not in government anymore, haven't been since 2014. I don't have a tremendous amount of transparency into the program objective memoranda that are the draft budgets that go uh, that, that go uh, to the to the White House for approval before they go to Congress. And so I'm not going to be able to give a detailed report card on how well DOD is doing in terms of moving investments into the kinds of capabilities that we think are needed for the future. But um, we, we, we all can see uh, how posture is changing. And the short answer is not very much. Um, I read in the press that the Navy now plans to have a fifth submarine uh, de uh, based routinely out of Guam. Uh, it's been four for many years now. Five is a good thing. Um, uh, that in itself is not going to move the needle. Uh, I also read that the Air Force is about to uh, start withdrawing its F-15s out of Kadena. The F-15s at Kadena uh, have been an important source of reassurance for the Japanese. They're an important source of military capabilities in our day-to-day -day operations in the Western Pacific. They are frankly more targets than they are assets once the war starts because Kadena is going to be under attack by literally hundreds of accurate ballistic and cruise missiles. Um, other than that, I don't see a lot of movement in terms of the posture of our forces in the theater. So, so again, as a as an observation to people who want to track progress or lack thereof uh, toward having a more robust deterrent vis-a-vis -vis China, I would say watch posture. Um, um, so, um, let me let me go back to concept. <clears throat> it's one thing to say that the legacy concept for power projection fails. I say that with high confidence. It's another thing to say what that new concept should be. For about three years now, uh, the joint staff has been embarked on an effort to develop a new joint war fighting concept, JWC. Um, We've had some um, ability to participate in that. We've done, we at RAND have done some analysis for the J7 as they've done their work. We've run some of their war games for them. Um, the document itself is in its third draft. Um, it is classified. I can say in this forum that what I have seen of it thus far is it's a pretty well-informed essay about the demands of fighting in the highly contested environment that can be created by China or Russia. It is not uh, a blueprint for how to fight in the future. Um, the standard for that blueprint goes all the way back to the 1980s when the Air Force and the Army jointly developed air land battle, which actually told combatant commanders how to employ forces at their disposal to locate, engage, and, and destroy the enemy. And, and, you know, time permitting, I could talk about exactly how that was done, but it was a blueprint. And that blueprint drove modernization, it drove posture, it drove training and doctrine. Um, I, I am not aware that we have that today. And without that, force planning, and I'm a force planner, is a little hard. Because the force planner's job is to provide the wherewithal to the warfighter to execute his or her operational concept. So the concept precedes um, the, the, the equipment, equipping of the force and the posturing of the force. So uh, incomplete on concept, probably a, a D on posture. Uh, and with regard to stuff, hardware, um, we do see glimmers of, of I, don't, I don't wanna just say hope, but progress. Secretary Kendall has been intently focused on China as the problem. 
Um, there's evidence that uh, he has directed the, 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 the application of resources to uh, several priority areas that he regards as being most important for enhancing our capabilities vis-a-vis -vis China. We can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, likewise, uh, General Berger and the Marine Corps uh, uh, certainly seems to get it, to understand the demands that the highly contested environment is placing on our future forces. And he's proposed some fairly radical changes to Marine Corps investment priorities and indeed force structure in order to make that happen. You've seen efforts to ramp up procurement of key weapons and munitions like El Razum, the long range anti-ship missile, like Maritime Strike Tactop, like uh, Argam ER, a longer range uh, missile for suppressing radar guided surface to air missiles. Um, you've seen the Air Force begin to slowly invest in those prosaic things that make air bases harder to kill. Things like fuel bladders, things like uh, just simply the ability to be more agile <clears throat> and moving your force around. Um, you've seen certainly investments in R&D in new concepts for generating combat power without reliance on big platforms and, and fixed facilities, as Mike said. The LCAT program, the low cost, uh, you should never do acronyms in public. Uh, attributable aircraft technology. The Air Force has flown something called the XQ-58 Valkyrie half a dozen times. It works. It's launched from a boat trailer. It's recovered with a parachute. For the first time since the dawn of air warfare, the Air Force has the pro prospect of generating combat power without reliance on runways and other fixed facilities. It puts the scud hunting problem on red. With total air superiority over the desert, we couldn't solve the scud hunting problem in Operation Desert Storm. I want to give that problem to China. Um, I don't know how much has been invested in that in the latest in the latest draft budget. I hope it's quite a bit. Again, the words coming from Secretary Kendall are are fairly encouraging. I know I've been running on for for too long. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there uh, in confidence that Mike will steer me back to. Uh, uh, being on topic as we as we go forward. Thank you. Dave, no, Dave, that's a great framing. And I just want to turn things now over to Chris with the same basic question of how are we doing by whatever metrics or goalposts you consider the most useful. Let me once again do a nice plug for your book, The Kill Chain, and also say, Chris, uh, I didn't give enough of his biography before. He wrote speeches for both Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice. He was the staff director for Senator John McCain during the last years of Senator McCain's extraordinarily distinguished uh, life and career, and is now the chairman of, of Anduril Industries, which seeks to actually solve some of the problems that Chris has been writing about in this book. So we're delighted to have you as well, my friend, and over to you. Well, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, always, always appreciate the plug for the book and additional sales. But uh, I think it was an extended series of footnotes and citations of Dave Akmanik and Mike O'Hanlon. So, um, you know, thank you both for just the phenomenal work and thinking you've done on this for far longer than I have. Um, you know, you, you've asked a big question, and I guess the answer I'd offer is, um, we're starting to make progress, but I don't think that it's as much or as fast as it needs to be. So, you know, you kind of bound this around 2018. I, I'd sort of, you know, pull it back to the left of, you know, more like 2014, I think, when you could start the clock on uh, what I would consider to be sort of like the, uh, you know, kind of the DC defense enterprises, kind of the collective reawakening to the problem of China. Um, you saw Russia's invasion of Ukraine, annexation of Crimea, uh, you know, things that China started doing that, you know, were very concerning with respect to island building and, you know, kind of increased aggression. Um, so, you know, to some extent, I think that clock started working in 2014, uh, the administration at the time started talking about, you know, kind of the reemergence of great power competition. Um, and then I think, as you correctly said, you know, the, the, the NDS, the national defense strategy, uh, in 2017, 2018, you know, really started to kind of put this into high relief. Um, so I, I think like where we are right now on the sort of, you know, kind of the strategic, uh, kind of domestic side is positive, right? I mean, you have a series of administrations now from Obama to Trump to Biden uh, that, you know, basically sort of span the political spectrum from one side of the other. And I think for the most part, we've converged around a consensus here in Washington that uh, the pacing threat is China. This is the highest, you know, kind of priority for uh, how to think about military modernization. 
Um, you know, I think that's good at a time where <clears throat> Democrats and Republicans can't agree that the grass is green and the sky is blue. I think we've focused on and, and really sort of built an enduring or it feels like a pretty durable consensus around the most important strategic priority for national defense. Uh, that's a good thing. Um, I think similarly, you know, the, the trend is moving favorably about, uh, you know, kind of us starting to get more serious about this. Um, I think that's to me the big question, right? We can, we can go into um, the details, and I know we will in the Q&A, uh, with respect to the types of things around posture and concepts of operation and different capabilities and puts and takes and where each of the services are. But, but I think the big fundamental question for the nation comes down to, are we serious or not? Um, because there have been plenty of times, even in recent history, where we've proclaimed uh, kind of new strategic direction, focus on uh, great power competition, even focus on China. I mean, going all the way back to, you know, the early days of the first Bush administration, you know, pre-September 11th, you know, we sort of began embarking on a similar type of venture only to see it, uh, you know, kind of uh, focused elsewhere. Um, I think the big question for us is, you know, uh, what has not happened in the past is at the level of sort of high strategy and rhetoric uh, being driven down into real nuts and bolts changes to how are we spending money on what we are spending money, uh, new ways of thinking about employing the force, as Dave mentioned. I think that's where the, the rubber really meets the road, um, but it will only meet the road if we are actually serious. Um, so I think uh, in, in this respect, you know, I know there's some disagreement, uh, you know, over whether the uh, current conflict in Ukraine is a gigantic distraction and waste of U.S. resources vis-a-vis uh, -vis the focus on China, uh, or whether it's something that's very important that we have to be focused on. I'm, I'm more of the latter camp, and I would actually say I actually think it's been uh, clarifying for us uh, from a are we serious perspective. I mean, you look at the kinds of things that Undersecretary for Acquisition and Sustainment Bill LaPlante has said recently about, you know, we need to focus on the production of capability. Um, you know, we can talk all we want about new ideas and new technologies and uh, new R&D efforts or, you know, the idea of producing more in theory, um, but it only is really going to matter if we are driving uh, real investment into production, into things that we can have uh, at, you know, at the ready, uh, because not only did that timeline for us, I think, start earlier, um, the timeline for, uh, you know, for China, again, I'm not privy to anything in particular, and we can debate about you know, whether there even is a timeline or a date out there in the calendar. But what it seems like uh, is over the time where we've debating whether we're serious or not, uh, the date that people are kind of benchmarking against, uh, you know, whether China might do something seems to keep moving to the left. Um, so originally it was out in the 2030s, and now it seems to be kind of creeping deeper into the 2020s. Um, and at some point here, you know, the timeline of whether we're serious about changing and whether they're serious about going, I worry, is going to collapse uh, and we're going to find ourselves kind of ambushed by the future um, and not ready for it in any contingency. And I think this is the, the big problem that we have right now is that, you know, and, and Dave put his finger right on it. Um, the things that we are trying to do take time. Um, even ramping up production of things that we have takes time, as the war in Ukraine has put into high relief. You know, you want more javelins, you want more gimlers. Yeah, that's going to take years. Um, you know, to say nothing of the, you know, kind of more exquisite munitions that Dave mentioned, to say nothing of platforms and other things. Um, you know, even in terms of how the department thinks about, you know, new R&D efforts, those things take longer, right? They're, they're, they're like future efforts that are going to deliver into the 2030s. And I think a lot of the good news story that people uh, seek to tell are things that may deliver you know, well outside the, you know, kind of, uh, you know, time window uh, of when they're really going to be needed. You know, so to me, the real question for us is how do we increase production of, of new things that we're going to need and would be able to have inside the next, you know, two to three to four years? Uh, and that's not just, you know, 20-year-old uh, things that we've had lying around for a long time. It's also new things that, you know, we could get after, um, both new capabilities and service of new conops. Um, but again, I come back to that question of whether we are serious or not, uh, because I think as a nation, when we are serious, we're capable of doing remarkable things on very uh, rapid timelines. And, and we've shown that, you know, certainly throughout our history, but even more recently uh, in the case of coronavirus, where as a nation, we decided that we were going to spend an inordinate amount of money um, trying to uh, develop a vaccine. We've put, you know, very big bets on a handful of potential solutions uh, many of them did not pan out. Some of them did. 
uh, we developed vaccines on a rapid timeline and, you know, um, notwithstanding your current condition, Michael, uh, you know, I think we we're doing pretty well vis-a-vis -vis COVID. Um, that, that is what America does when it's serious. You know, we can, we make big bets, we consolidate them. Uh, we prioritize, uh, not just to sort of have more of the old things that we have, but to develop new things that we desperately need and need quickly. Um, that's going to necessarily entail a level of risk. It's going to require people to uh, incur consequences for doing things differently, for running the risk of potentially failing or waste, fraud, and abuse. Um, but I think this is the, the, the only course of action that we have if we want to be truly in a position to, uh, God forbid, be ready for a conflict if one is kind of thrust upon us, but ideally uh, to have a better and better deterrent posture you know, now and in the coming years to keep pushing that timeline uh, farther to the right rather than see it sort of creep, uh, continuing to creep uh, farther to the left. Um, so yeah, really look forward to the conversation and thanks again for having me. And likewise, thank you. Uh, let me ask one clarifying question of each of you and then I wanna get into a little bit more on the programmatic and concept and posture side. So also thank you both for framing things in those terms. Clarifying question, are there specific scenarios that concern you most? Dave, I know that the potential Chinese invasion attempt against Taiwan has been one of your preeminent concerns. Is that your number one concern or just among the top five? And the same question really for you, Chris. Yes, uh, Mike, the, the, the Chinese multi-domain invasion of Taiwan, I think is the appropriate scenario for evaluating our force. Why? Uh, because it is un unarguably highly plausible right? Chinese leaders, one after the other, have publicly stated that they will not rule out the use of military force to compel unification with the mainland. And, and, uh, and, the, and the way you do that, that has the highest probability of success from the Chinese standpoint is, is with an invasion. Coercive strategies that leave the initiative with the adversary can be very open-ended, um, very uncertain in their effects, and I don't think the Chinese are looking to get into a war that would involve the United States that they can't have some control over the end game for. It's also the most appropriate scenario because it's the most demanding. I think it's more likely that we'll end up fighting China over some issue in the South China Sea, some issue in the East China Sea that involves Japan that we get drawn into conceivably on the Korean Peninsula. But none of those scenarios has the time pressure of a Taiwan scenario, right? The, the, the Chinese could conceivably land 100,000 troops on that island in a matter of two weeks. That is a tremendously stressing problem for the combatant commander. Um, and, and, and for that reason, it's the, it's the problem I want to use to evaluate US forces. Um, if we can prevail in that very stressing scenario, I feel quite confident that we'll have the wherewithal to deal with the less stressing scenarios. And that's the one, as I go over to Chris, that's the one that you've both written about and alluded to war games where we lose 17 in a row at the Pentagon, right, over the years. That's, as, as Chris described in his book, The Kill Chain. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and I would agree with Dave. I mean, I think that is, that is the most stressing scenario that puts the problem in the highest relief. Um, I think that from a... Uh, you know, kind of how we think about how we fight and with what we fight, um, you know, the entire sort of rethinking of the American way of war. I think that is the place where, uh, you know, that thinking is really going to have to be done and I think is starting to be done. Um, I, I guess like the, the additional piece that I would add here is I, I'm not, look, I'm again, not privy to anything that uh, any special knowledge um, and I'm not sure it's, you know, it's clear in the mind of uh, you know, the Chinese leadership that they want to make a go at Taiwan here in the near future. I think, you know, the additional concern I have is the kind of steady erosion of America's deterrent capability and what that would mean for alternative ways that, uh, you know, uh, China would sort of extend its, uh, you know, extend its control over Taiwan, but also other uh, U.S. allies and partners in the region of, you know, not seeking to do this primarily through hard power, um, but through a, you know, very coercive strategy that nonetheless uh, kind of brings these countries uh, to heel uh, in a way that makes it very difficult to, uh, you know, to kind of have the freedom of maneuver and the freedom of strategic flexibility that the U.S. has enjoyed in the region, uh, allies and partners who want to work with us and are capable of doing so under the pressure they would be facing otherwise. 
So I want to do one follow-up question, one big broad follow-up question probably for both of you. And then we start going to the audience pretty soon because a lot of questions are coming in. I think as I listen to you both, and of course read you both, I hear you saying that maybe the glass is you know, slightly more than half full in terms of how the US defense innovation and acquisition system is starting to perform as well as reposturing and deployment of US forces abroad, uh, but not nearly enough. And so you're trying to give sort of a gentle, you know, encouragement to our colleagues who are actually doing this um, in, in, in the military, in industry. Uh, and of course, Chris, you are in industry and Dave, you support these efforts at the Pentagon, but you're trying not to sound in any way, shape or form complacent or even of the view that we're definitively headed on the right path. Because just to sort of very quickly recapitulate, I hear you both saying, good to see a lot of R&D being done. Uh, good to see the focus on great power deterrence in doctrine and strategy. Uh, you didn't both say this in so many words, but maybe good to see uh, the proliferation of smaller satellites to make our command and control systems more resilient against enemy attack and the ongoing awareness that we're still vulnerable to cyber attack, although I'm not sure we've done nearly enough to make the systems themselves survivable. So you can say more if you wish in a second. Uh, we've done well at starting up some interesting R&D programs on things like unmanned underwater vehicles and a pilotless aircraft that could do different new things without runways. And so, and we're buying more munitions of various types that are crucial for a lot of the scenarios that you are focused on, especially the Taiwan scenarios. So all that's on the good side. On the bad side, we actually don't have most of these capabilities in the field today. For example, this X-58 aircraft or other unmanned systems that could be launched by rocket tube and therefore very hard to find if, if deployed on Okinawa or somewhere else. We're not actually fielding those as best any of us know in the unclassified literature here we, and, and budget documents. Yes, the Navy plans to start building medium and large unmanned surface vessels in the latter part of the decade, but it's not actually building any now. I just reviewed a CBO report that came out this month that says as much. And so any hope, Dave, of putting these um, Permanent stationed, permanently stationed uh, unmanned underwater vehicles out in the Western Pacific where they could quickly launch sensors and anti-ship missiles in the event of a Chinese invasion attempt, we can't do that now. And in fact, we don't really have a schedule for when we will be able to do it. So am I accurately summarizing the state of play and the bottom line that each of you sort of sees the glass as maybe slightly half full, but, but not nearly full enough? Uh, and is there any one or two, any one or two areas of specific programmatic action where where you would really want to light a fire under us? By the way, I should have mentioned the Marine Corps as well. I and mean, yes, they're doing a lot of interesting things, but they don't really have major new locations from which to do them yet. And I'm not really aware they have longer range surface to surface missiles that they can now deploy and didn't have before either. So even though Force Design 2030 is impressive, it sort of, again, falls into this category of on the one hand, on the other, you know, maybe the glass is slightly half full, but a long ways to go. Have I fairly summarized things? And where do you really want to light a fire under us? Dave, again, starting with you, if I could, please. Yeah, Mike, I think you've got it exactly right. I wouldn't quibble with anything that you said. And and to, to, to uh, further the metaphor a little bit, there's a hole in the bottom of the glass. Uh, China's not standing still. They're still cranking out hundreds and hundreds of accurate ballistic and cruise missiles uh, every year. Um, they now have the largest Navy in the world. Um, you know, and, 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 and it's not just hardware, their training is getting more realistic. They're getting after the kind of uh, issues with their, with their human capital that they are aware of. Um, and so we've got to run pretty hard just to stay even with that. Um, Yes, and, and uh, while there are promising things that are being experimented with, um, they are not getting in the hands of the warfighter yet because of this lag time uh, between a decision to produce something and to actually reach IOC and then produce it in numbers. You know, we used to turn out literally thousands of bombers a year in World War II. We're, we, we are struggling to turn out hundreds of expendable cruise missiles. Now, it's just the nature of the industrial base and the complexity of these systems. Um, your challenge to identify uh, a couple of priority areas. Um, I, first, I want to 
um, channel Chris for a moment. Chris's basic, and Chris, you're going to correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the way I quote you. You want us to get off of this decades long vector of producing ever more exquisite, ever more expensive platforms in ever smaller numbers, which is an inherently brittle approach to warfare against a capable adversary and into the opposite, buying large numbers of inexpensive but very smart things without human beings in them or with small numbers of human beings manning them so that we can get back to the principle of mass and warfare. And I would encourage all the services to put their put a lot of chips on that basic philosophy. Uh, start radic start um, really uh, uh, rapid experimentation with these things. The, the technologies associated with the platforms are basically 1980s technologies. So it's not, we don't have to wait for any magic developments for these things to happen. And if we start uh, uh, experimenting with them in the field, putting some things out there, confronting the Chinese with, with things they don't expect, I think we'll get um, not only war fighting value out of that more quickly, but, but, um, but, but, um, will punch above our weight in terms of their deterrent value simply by 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 getting off the, the track that China expects us to pursue. Thank you. And Chris to you. Yeah, and just to add to that, I mean I I I don't want to come off as uh uh as 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 more optimistic than I actually am. Um because I think the the real challenge that we have here is uh, sort of a fundamental need to disrupt the way that we have thought about and built and plan to use the United States military now for, you know, a generation or more. Um, and, and I think, you know, Dave mentioned some of the points that I think bring it home. Um, just to focus on shipbuilding. Uh, China already has a larger Navy than us. China's shipbuilding industry is about half of global shipbuilding. I think America's last I saw is like less than 5%. Um, so not only is China not standing still, the foundation that they have to continue production at scale dwarfs us by an order of magnitude. Um, so, you know, we can talk all we want about having a Navy that is, you know, 355 or 400 and whatever, or 600 or whatever ships. Uh, we're not going to build it. We don't have the capacity to build it. Um, and they have the capacity to just continue to grow the size of that fleet. Uh, at, at a way that is just impossible for us to keep up considering the industrial base that we're starting from. So it, it's just to say, it's not to talk America down, it's just to be honest about where we are and say, that's not a fight we're gonna win. We're not gonna build, win the shipbuilding race. Um, we have to think differently about how we deal with that problem uh, asymmetrically. Um, you know, again, you look at the geography of Asia, it's not the same as the geography of Europe. Like St. Hymars is not gonna save us here. Um, I, I think, you talk about the production of things that we have. Great, you know, like I want to have more of the things that we have. It's gonna take us years to do that. And I remember, you know, sitting through briefings when I was back in the Senate Armed Services Committee asking the Department of Defense why they were, uh, you know, once again, year after year, under investing in munitions and weapons lines. And the answer was always, well, you know, we're, we have limited resources. We're going to put those resources into you know, platforms and systems that take longer to procure. And in the event that we get into a pinch, uh, we can turn those weapons lines up real fast. Um, you know, we've been running that social science experiment for 10 years, and it turns out it's not true. Uh, it takes years to produce even basic munitions, you know, like javelin, javelin weapons and things of that sort, to say nothing of, you know, the higher end things like El Razum. So I think it's more to say, like, if we are going to put ourselves in a position to be competitive, you know, whether you sort of uh, snap the date, uh, you know, at 2025 or 2028 or 2033, um, we are going to need to do things uh, that create radically different incentives for our industrial base to change and be changed uh, so that we can produce exactly what Dave mentioned, much larger quantities of lower cost, uh, more expendable, more intelligent systems things that we will lose in conflict and lose in large numbers. And when lost, we can replenish quickly. Um, this isn't, you know, God forbid, right? I mean, a conflict with China, this isn't going to be like, you know, we're going to lose most of what we have. And then, you know, we're going to take over Ford Motor Companies in three and a half years or so, the arsenal of democracy will ride to the rescue. Um, 
we have to be completely retooling uh, how we how we sort of operate uh, and how we have you know thought about the industrial base uh, in this country, which again goes back to whether we're serious or not. This isn't just about having more of what we needing more of what we have. Um, it's about new things that we need to be able to get into inventory much faster, get into production much faster. Um, and we're not talking about you know uh, you know a Mars landing here. We're not talking about things that are going to take into the 2030s. We're talking about things that have either been you know, you, you mentioned things like, uh, you know, autonomous systems, unmanned systems, you know, different types of weapons, you know, things that we've been playing around with as a country now for 20 years in some cases. Um, the technology is available. It's, it's relatively proven in some cases, like quite mature. Uh, the question again comes back to whether we are serious or not. Um, if we are serious, we can actually catalyze the development and production of these types of technologies on a rapid timeline. Uh, it's not going to happen tomorrow. Um, but boy, we don't also have to wait until, you know, the early 2030s for it either. So, you know, it, it's fundamentally about the, the incentives that we create. Um, and I see, uh, I see good things, things that we can be happy about at the level of rhetoric, at the rhetoric of sort of strategic consensus, and increasingly even about, you know, the rhetoric of, you know, the need for, uh, for, for greater production. Um, but I'm only going to believe it when I actually see programs being started, funding being increased, um, you know, things that really prove to the government and to industry that we are going in a different direction here um, and, and doing it in a pretty uh, sort of non-reversible way. Um, and, and we've just not had that level of seriousness to date. And I, and I hope that that's the thing that we'll soon see, you know, kind of turning here. Great. Let me ask about, there are a couple of audience questions on the industrial base as well. And I want to come back to those in just a second. But let me ask, uh, I think you both rightly emphasize the importance of large numbers of attributable kinds of objects, sensors, payloads, platforms that we can deploy and afford to lose. But are there also some high-end systems that we're just not acquiring enough of or at all? And I think of three examples in particular where I'd be curious for your reaction. One of them is the concept of an unmanned combat aircraft flying off aircraft carriers that could have twice the range of manned aircraft. And the, say, the, the Navy has resisted this concept, even though it's been around a while, but you could theoretically, as I understand the technology, uh, have a 1500 kilometer un, un, unrefueled radius of operations with this kind of a system. And the Navy hasn't really moved in the direction of deploying it. A second would be now that the INF treaty is gone, should we be building a one to 3000 mile surface to surface missile? I think there is some R&D happening but we knew how to build those missiles in the 1980s or before, speaking of that era, Dave, and we could presumably accelerate the transition and give General Berger some of the capabilities on various islands that he doesn't have now, even if he does make his Marines more deployable and expeditionary. And then the last would be the B-21 bomber, which is about to be unveiled uh, publicly in a couple of weeks, I understand, but we have a relatively modest buy, not not tiny, but I think 80 to 100 planes, but it's, it's replacing a previous, you know, partly replacing a previous bomber fleet, and you add up all the bombers we've got, and it's not that many. So anything in those categories where you'd like to see us do more, um, not just in the small stuff, but even in some of the bigger stuff? And Dave, um, Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, all of those things, Mike, have merit. Um, it's a question of bang for the buck. Um, I was lobbying with others, the Navy, back in 2010, 2011, when I was in the building to produce a, a UCAS, an unmanned aircraft for their carrier, which would have longer range and stealth. We got stiffed. Um, frankly, carriers are never going to generate huge amounts of payload, even in a fairly benign environment. So uh, to the extent we're gonna hold on to carriers, yes, it would be better to equip them with a longer range unmanned system for delivering weapons uh, or doing ISR. Uh, with regard to surface-to-surface -surface missiles, um, yes, they, they're good things. Ballistic missiles are terrific because they do much better against terminal defenses than cruise missiles. And the uh, amphibious invasion force coming across the Strait of Taiwan is going to be in the midst of a hellacious air defense. So a modest number of high speed missiles, whether they're hypersonic or good old fashioned ballistic missiles can help pave the way for the cruise missiles that are gonna come in and do most of the killing. 
Um, a missile that could fly from Guam to the Strait would be a very good thing to have. Um, I am not confident that either the Philippines or Japan is going to be crazy about the idea of long range surface to surface missiles being launched from their territory into China or, or the environment or the environment. In NATO, uh, of course, the distance problem is not nearly as severe. So PRISM, which is the successor to ATACMS, which has about a 500 kilometer range, is just fine for that scenario. And I think uh, the Army should be content to be focusing its investments on weapons and systems for the Korea scenario, for the Russia scenario, and maybe not worry so much about uh, getting massive numbers of long range missiles for, for the Pacific. B-21 will be an important part of our force structure for decades to, to come, but it's not the only way to get long range uh, aircraft into the, into the fight. The Air Force has experimented successfully with something called palletized munitions, which can turn C-17s into bombers with no uh, modifications required to the avionics in the airplane. Uh, basically, they're just dropping certain kinds of munitions, including El Razum, out the back end of a C-17. So I think the Air Force should move very aggressively to make prism, to make uh, pelletized munitions a reality. And yes, continue to, to move ahead with the B-21 program, recognizing that in future wars, at some point, we're going to run out of, um, of standoff weapons. And you're going to want a platform that can get closer to the enemy and deliver more, you know, more level of effort weapons like JDAM. B-21 is going to be the platform for that in the future. Super. Chris, any thoughts on that question? No, I mean, I'd, I'd largely agree with the list. I mean, the, the only one I'd throw on there as well is the undersea force. Um, but, you know, again, we've we've wanted as a nation, I think, to increase production of, you know, fast attack submarines. Um, that takes an enormous amount of time, right? Uh, even introducing, you know, Virginia payload modules into the systems that we're currently building is, uh, you know, is a struggle with the state of the industrial base. So I, I think that's kind of the problem across all of the, uh, kind of priorities that we're talking about here. It's like you, you can make a strategic argument for why you'd want to kind of radically move undersea, why you'd want to kind of prioritize long range strike uh, like a B-21 over short range tactical air, um, why you'd want to have uh, more game in terms of long range fires for the army. Um, all of these under the best of circumstances are going to take years and probably in some cases, you're not going to get those things until the 2030s. So, uh, the, 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 the challenge, I think, in the immediate term is while those good things are hopefully, uh, you know, going to deliver later on, um, what are things that we can do faster now? You know, uh, different ideas that allow us to come at this problem differently, um, regardless of how you slice it, right? I mean, shooting a long way, flying a long way, uh, that's going to be an expensive program. That's a long development cycle. That's a hard problem to solve. Um, are there different ways that we can be innovating to uh, Dave's earlier point, you know, in terms of concepts of operation, uh, where we can think about coming at this problem differently, where we can start creating, uh, you know, the anti-access area denial bubbles and the red rings of death uh, for the adversary, rather than consistently getting pushed farther and farther away by what the adversary is fielding vis-a-vis uh, -vis us. Um, again, I think this is an area where um, I think we'd be wrong to say that concept has to lead technology or technology has to lead concept. I think these things have to be developed iteratively uh, in a way that uh, allow you to make the most rapid progress, but also, I think, really kind of open the eyes both to the technologists on the one side and the operators on the other about what's actually feasible and different ways to go about solving this problem without having to incur an enormous amount of technological risk to do something that is quite difficult, as opposed to something that we could pull together, you know, in two to three to four years, uh, that would just create additional problems for the adversary, potentially give them some strategic pause and buy ourselves some more time. Great. So a few questions from the audience that I'll turn to now. And one of them is really, in many ways, sort of a repackaging of, of material you've already addressed, but I'd like to hear your answers myself. It's, are there certain of the military services that you think are doing the best? Uh, I won't ask you to be overly critical of anybody unless you wish, but that would sort of be the corollary question. Any service that needs to really get after this set of questions uh, better and, and with, with just more of a, of a focus on the urgency of the task. 
And again, Dave, I can start with you, please. Okay. <clears throat> I, I don't I don't have a lot of transparency into the inner workings of all the services. Um, uh, you see every service creating entities to spur innovation, whether it's AFWIC in the Air Force, the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, Air F Army Futures Command, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all good. Um, it, at the end of the day, it comes down to uh, execution. I think we're, we're you know, we're, 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 we're generating, we're, we are, so we're, at, we're, at, we're beyond step one of the 12-step program of Alcoholics Anonymous. We've admitted we have a problem. We are focusing on that problem. We are generating ideas and concepts for getting after the problem. I have not seen any service actually take the plunge into uh, altering its investment priorities in a dramatic way to get after what looked like the most promising ways to, to actually execute these new concepts. And I'll, I'll just leave it at that for now. Great, Chris? Yeah, so um, I think the answer is still to some extent too soon to tell. I mean, I think there are, there are positive things to be, to be called out that deserve credit. I mean, I think what, what General Berger is trying to do in the Marine Corps deserves all the credit in the world. I think the challenge is, as I think both of you mentioned, is that um, you know, the ideas uh, make a lot of sense. Um, the concepts make a lot of sense. You know, the, the, the drive and energy is there. The question is, how is it being turned into real programs, uh, stood up into new capabilities that can be produced at scale to really follow through on the, on the supervision that the Commandant has? Um, I think the jury's still out on that. Um, I, I would echo, you know, comment Dave made earlier. Um, again, I think uh, we'll, we'll really see, you know, kind of the, the fullness of this effort in the FY24 budget cycle. But I think what Secretary Kendall is seeking to do in the Air Force with his series of operational imperatives uh, is, is really good. Um, you know, he, he is trying to use this sort of awesome position that he has as a secretary with Title 10 authority to remake the service, to reprioritize where the service is spending money, um, not based on, you know, kind of existing programs of record, but actually on integrated mission imperatives that uh, we need to be able to get after, they need to be able to get after as an Air Force. Um, and, and really, uh, again, you know, creating a, a significant amount of churn and disruption uh, to the program that he inherited and the one that he's seeking to, uh, to put forward in FY24. Proof will be in the pudding. Um, but, you know, again, here you have a senior leader using the authority that that person has uniquely in Title 10 to try to disrupt the way the service does things. Um, I think that's fantastic. Um, I, I think there's a lot of other cases where the rhetoric is really good, but the follow through uh, remains to be seen. I mean, I think what the Navy, the Navy has been on a long journey uh, to wrap its head around unmanned systems and embrace the concept. Um, I think they're, they're, they're making strides, you know, they're, they're saying the right things, they're coming to the realization that the only way they're going to have the capacity, the magazine depth that they're going to need uh, is on the back of unmanned systems of all kinds, right? Air, undersea, surface. Um, but, you know, this isn't, this is like, you know, first or second semester level economics of how you actually get that into production. Um, you actually build programs around it. You create demand from industry. You make this an enduring priority where you're going to spend a lot of money over a long period of time. Uh, lo and behold, industry will respond. New industry, old industry, big industry, small industry, uh, to try to uh, to actually execute and follow through on that vision. Um, so again, for for all of this, you know, I think there's there's good pri you know good progress that's uh, that's being made. Some of it's more rhetoric. Some of it is increasingly becoming reality. All of it, I think, proofs in the pudding. Um, but you know, it's good that we can actually you know point to a series of things that we can try to be hopeful about. Um, I think the big question is, you know, we've been saying all along here is, are we making enough progress fast enough? Um, thus far, I would say the answer to that is still no. So two more questions, and this has been a great session, but we have a couple more pieces I want to bring in from excellent questions from the audience. One does get to the industrial base, and there's a couple of questions associated with this general subject. Chris, you wrote in your book about how you'd like to see maybe 5% of the Pentagon budget, maybe $30 billion a year, essentially in a competitive fund that could be awarded to those uh, companies, those concepts that were most promising for building and closing the kill chain. 
Uh, so that's part of the question is, do you think we still need that kind of an incentive acquisition budget that essentially is outside the normal system? There's a second question about the overall uh, role of smaller startups, Silicon Valley, the kind of company that you're involved with now. Uh, are we doing enough to bring in new players, new innovative players into the defense acquisition world? And then the third piece of it is, are we redressing vulnerabilities in the supply chain? Whether it's because we still depend on overseas parts and components and from parts of the world that aren't so reliable. Uh, you know, and one question actually was, are we telling the world too much about all these vulnerabilities, even as we try to put the, push the information out there so people can try to solve uh, the vulnerabilities and build new capacity to replace some of these questionable suppliers that we still have in the supply chain today. So that's a bunch of questions. Don't either one of you please feel obliged to go after all of them, but in the broad subject of how we're doing with the defense acquisition ecosystem, you know, what do you see as the progress? What do you see as still the necessary reform? And on this one, Chris, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of just tie them all together. Um, you know, look, I think in terms of talking about our vulnerabilities, um, I'm, I'm okay with a, a level of risk there because I think the, you know, the folks that we're worried about the most have a pretty good understanding of what our vulnerabilities are. I'm not sure we're tipping our hand too much in that regard. Um, I'd rather actually, you know, get the benefit of uh, ringing the alarm bell a little bit to drive more focus, uh, you know, kind of internally, domestically about the need to uh, to be to be better there. I, I think the broader question, um, you know, a series of questions has to do with how are we actually going about modernization? And, and yeah, my point in the book was that uh, this isn't a problem uh, necessarily about acquisition, right? It is a it is a problem writ large about how we think about requirements, how we build programs and budgets, uh, how we then acquire things, how the Congress authorizes and appropriates. That whole process has become impervious to disruption. And uh, much of what is needed in terms of the disruption to that, I think, is uh, a different way to approach the problem so that we can actually see what the problem is we're trying to solve, uh, as opposed to sort of grasping at pieces of it. So um, having, a, you know, having a, you know, more of an ability to actually compete out things that we're going to need from a uh, sort of mission outcome standpoint. You know, are we actually uh, putting investment into the types of capabilities that need to be brought together and integrated to achieve mission effects? Um, the Pentagon doesn't think that way. It doesn't budget that way. Congress doesn't either. Um, so having some kind of a process where we can actually see ourselves uh, accurately, I think, is the first process of uh, or the first step of actually beginning to solve this problem. Um, and I think that does involve uh, a greater degree of budget flexibility. I, I don't necessarily think it has to take the form of what you know everybody typically assumes that it needs to take. Of you know, Congress just gives the department you know a twenty billion dollar blank check every year and sort of like hopes for the best. Um, they're never going to do that, and they kind of shouldn't. Um, it's more, I think, to say uh, for a different class of systems, things that are not you know uh, Virginia class submarines and B twenty ones and GBSDs. Uh, but the types of sort of larger quantities, lower cost, more expendable, attritable, autonomous systems, uh, weapons, things that we could actually be buying more regularly, things that could be getting better uh, on a more rapid basis. Um, how do we actually set up an alternative process so that uh, we can actually create incentives for disruption, you know, where we can create more competition in industry, where we can actually create incentives to, to be surprised, uh, rather than constantly always getting what we uh, say that we want, even if it's not necessarily the thing that we need, um, and 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 actually compete these things out differently. That I still think there is a need for. I, I don't think that we've yet sort of identified, uh, you know, a, a sort of a, an enduring process that is impervious to, you know, this senior leader or that senior leader. You know, it tends to always kind of come back to the sort of great man and great woman thesis of change. Um, you know, what individual is doing the best, despite the fact that they can fall down a well tomorrow and never be heard from again? Like, how do we actually create alternative processes uh, to create uh, new capabilities on a rapid timeline and get them to production fast? That's, I think, the answer to the question of, you know, Silicon Valley, non-traditional companies, new entrants. Um, the department writ large and Congress uh, have done a great amount over the past, you know, call it five to 10 years to create more incentives uh, and easier paths for non-traditional players to get in the game and get going. 
Um, that's good. The problem is that too few of those things are actually getting to large scale production. So again, I mean, to echo Bill LaPlante, it is all about production, but it's not just about the production of things that we've had for 25 or 30 years. It's also about production of new things that we're desperately going to need. Um, things that can be produced now, things that are ready to be produced now, um, but things that are not necessarily being produced now because they are, um, not in line with a given program of record, or they may even be a threat to a given program of record. So there's bureaucratic incentives to not move these things to scale. That's again, where I think senior leaders need to be informing themselves and intervening more to find those uh, kind of important capabilities, kind of trajectory changing capabilities and using their authority to put resources into them to get them to production. Um, because unless and until you do that, you know, we're, we're just screwing around uh, with innovation theater. We're not really making an impact at large scale. Great, Chris. Thank you, Dave. Same question for you. And then I've got one final question from the audience specifically for you. And then we'll wrap up. So please. Yeah, I, um, I'm aware of the time. And, and as a mere political scientist, I have nothing to add to what Chris said. I think he got it just right. Thank you. Well, thank you as well. But let me now give the final question, which is from my good friend and colleague, Steve Piper, a former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine and now at Stanford, and uh, also spent a lot of his career working on arms control and strategic issues when he wasn't you know, ambassador to Ukraine or otherwise working in that part of the world. And he's curious for your further reflections on the state of Russia's military uh, and what we've learned this year. And you alluded at the beginning of our, of our hour long, long session to the fact that maybe Russia isn't quite what we thought or quite what they were uh, 12 months ago, but Ambassador Pfeiffer would love to hear your further thoughts on that, please. Yeah. Thanks, Steve, for that excellent question. Steve and I were colleagues together in the Foreign Service way back in the day. Uh, I have great respect for him and his work. Uh, yeah, without question, Russia today is not what it was eight months ago. They've suffered serious losses of personnel, of morale, and of systems on the battlefield of Ukraine. And by all accounts, they're going to continue suffering those losses. That doesn't mean that we should be satisfied indefinitely with the posture and capabilities we have in NATO. Um, I think prudence demands that we assume that at some point Russia is going to stop the flow, stop the bleeding, start rebuilding. Uh, and I would just put out there five years after the end of hostilities, large scale hostilities in Ukraine, we ought to be prepared. We ought to we ought to hold ourselves to the standard of having an effective force that can defend NATO territory all along the eastern flank. That doesn't need to distract massively from our focus on China. Um, I think a decent U.S. heavy ground force presence in, in the theater, stationed, not rotationally deployed, uh, new generation of anti-armor weapons, some distributed um, sensing uh, 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 grid, primarily based on land uh, because we're defending our own territory. Prosaic things of that nature should be sufficient to co convince a rational leader in Moscow not to uh, not to consider using force against NATO. So uh, the problem just got easier. Um, our allies are more focused on addressing the problem, at least for the time being. Um, but but it hasn't gone away. So we still need to we still need to walk and chew gum at the same time, if you will. Well. Uh... Chris Brose, Dave Achmanik, thank you both very much. Very rich conversation. Thanks for the work you continue to do. And, you know, I think uh, I don't want to summarize. You can, you can correct me if I've get, got this wrong, but it sounds like you're both giving the overall effort some degree of grading in the general range of a B. But even if that's true, it's not meant to be a gentleman's B. It could be more of a B minus than a B plus. In any event, it's not enough because it's a competition where we got to be aiming for an A. So if that's not an unfair way to summarize some of the arguments, uh, I will thank you both again for joining us. Thank the audience. Wish you both the best and wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving as we sign off from Brookings. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for the opportunity.